Welcome to Native Talk Arizona, presented by Native Health and KRDP 90.7 FM. I'm host Lanasha Puwadi. Later in the show, I'll talk with speaker and best-selling author DJ Vanis. But right now, Susan Levy talks with Dr. Barbara Mink and Dr. Miranda Haskey about the upcoming Arizona American Indian Youth Conference on Health and the Environment. I'm Susan Levy, and on the phone with us today is Dr. Barbara Mink and Dr. Miranda Haskey, who's going to be telling us about the 8th Annual Navajo Education Conference. Welcome to the show, Barbara and Miranda. Hi, thank you, Susan. Welcome. So before we get started, Barbara, tell us a little bit about yourself. I am a uh, professor and a program director of the education doctoral program at Fielding Graduate University, which is based out of Santa Barbara, California. I've been a professor there and an administrator since, uh, oh golly, for about 40 years. So I have a lot of higher education experience working with a diverse student body uh, And our university is a distributed university, so our students are all over the world, basically, working on a higher degree in education, a doctorate in higher education. And I'm actually a publicly elected official in Austin, Texas, because I serve on the board of trustees of the Austin Community College District. So those are kind of my educational credentials and lots of international travel and consulting. Wow. You are busy. And Miranda, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, yeah, eh. uh, I'm saying hello to you in the Diné language. And I am a professor of sociology in the School of Business and Social Science at Diné College, the first tribally controlled college on the Navajo Nation and throughout the nation. I spent my career in higher education as well. Um, and I'm also an associate faculty with Fielding School of Leadership Studies in, at Fielding Graduate University, and I teach uh, courses there with them. I'm also an alumni from Fielding Graduate University and helping uh, co-facilitate um, the Navajo doctoral uh, graduates who are pursuing study with Fielding Graduate University. And I reside here in Look Ajigai, Arizona. And my clans are Ashi uh, the Salt Clan I'm born for. There's a son, Ashish Chin, the Many Goats Clan. And my maternal grandfathers are Kisachi, Red House Clan. And my paternal grandfathers are Tordichi, the Bitter Water Clan. Thank you for having me. Well, welcome, both of you. So I know we were kind of um, checking things out and that you all are hosting the 8th Annual Navajo Education Conference. So Tell me a little bit, when is this, where is this, who is this for, um, all the information on it. Well, I'll go ahead and start, and, and <clears throat> Miranda, please chime in. It'll be June 7 at the uh, Navajo Nation Museum in Window Rock, Arizona. Uh, we'll start with registration in the morning, and again, it's an open registration. There's no registration fee. Anybody is able to attend. The opening remarks will be done by either the president or the vice president of the nation. And then uh, Miranda uh, and Dr. Henry Fowler will be giving an overview of the conference. And then throughout the day, we are having different presentations of research that's been done by Navajo educators around issues uh, facing the nation and educational sovereignty. So we have uh, one of the deans from Navajo Tech who's going to be talking about Cultivating Indigenous Leadership in Higher Ed. Uh, We have have a gentleman who's just completed his dissertation, uh, Dr. Jason Arviso, who's going to be talking about broadband Internet services on the nation. Uh, Dr. Viola Hosky is going to be uh, talking about her research that she's done on building grit and growth mindset in uh, Navajo children. And then... uh, Ms. Claudia Russell Edgewater, who uh, is going to be uh, talking. She's a principal education specialist, and she's going to be looking at um, the gifted and talented Navajo youth and how to work with them. Then later in the afternoon, uh, Dr. Delphina Daish is going to be talking about her work on grandparents raising grandchildren at the nation, kind of their strengths and challenges and their needs. 
And then the day will conclude with Dr. Maxine Sloan looking at kind of indigenous concept of uh, financial literacy curriculum for Navajo students. And our closing will be done by Ms. Rose Graham, who's a real active sponsor of the conference, and she's the director of the Office of Navajo Nation Scholarship and Financial Assistance. So we've got a very full day, uh, and all the presenters are going to be talking about stuff that's relevant to educators, teachers, leaders across the nation about building educational sovereignty. So, Miranda, I've got a question for you, um, since Barbara just answered that one. Mm -hmm. Is this conference geared for educators, or is it open to anybody? Yes, it is uh, geared for uh, educators. Okay, so educators of, so primary, secondary, higher education, everybody, Mm -hmm. correct? All educators? There is a focus on higher education. Many of our doctoral students do complete their dissertation studies, uh, examining uh, pre-K to 20 in their dissertation research. So it it will cover educational research from pre-K through secondary high school. Barbara, how has this conference changed in the past eight years? Every year, we have different people who are doing research on different aspects of um, growing more uh, robustness in the education system on the Navajo Nation. And this came out of um, some of the work that the that the students are doing through their dissertation research at Fielding Graduate University. So as they study different aspects, uh, their research is presented. So every year there'll be different presenters who are doing research in certain areas of um, educational sovereignty on the nation. So we always have some presentations, and it's always supported by the president of the nation. Uh, President Nez was a strong supporter. President Nygren, of course, has his doctorate in education, is a very strong supporter of the conference as well. But the topics change every year. So we look at leadership development, we look at growing educational leaders, and we look at bringing in the culture and the language more in the educational system, like Dr. Haskey said, all the way from pre-K with looking at Head Start programs all the way through higher education. So what do you hope attendees get out of the conference? I think it's a unique conference that convenes on the Navajo Nation and um, includes educators across the um, educational systems on Navajo, um, notably higher education as well with the two colleges from Diné College and Navajo Technical University. Uh, And uh, many of our um, doctoral students when they come, gives them an opportunity to, to hear firsthand the doctoral research that Navajo doctorates have completed at Fielding Graduate University, um, mm-hmm. all of which is typically uh, based on their research that has, uh, some of which has been approved through the Navajo Nation Human Research Review Board for those who've conducted interviews. And so the, the research has been approved um, through the IRB protocol in that, in, in that forum. And it also inspires future um, doctoral candidates that may be interested in uh, pursuing their graduate studies, including their doctorate in uh, education and hopefully at Fielding Graduate University. And so mm-hmm. we serve as a model uh, that's inspirational uh, and is unique in that we're really coming back to the Navajo Nation and um, honoring that commitment to share with the Navajo Nation the research that we've conducted on the Navajo populace and uh, in hopes that the literature will certainly, um, the scholarly research will add to the literature, but also demonstrate to the Navajo Nation the investment that they in higher education for fielding graduate Mm -hmm. university Navajo doctorate. It's a professional conference, so educators are learning from other people who have done research in best practices and in in advancing knowledge in teaching and learning and also in leadership. So it's a time to engage with, with fellow educators and to learn from each other. And one of the exciting things, um, 
that's happened in this too, Susan, is when we did one of these conferences a couple of years ago, a book actually came out uh, of the conference, uh, and it's out through uh, Amazon publication. It's called the, the Future of Navajo Education, and all the chapters are written by members of the nation. So there'd be chapters on looking at the future of Navajo education, and Dr. Manley Begay wrote that chapter. Uh, Henry Fowler has got an international reputation in mathematics education. He presented at the conference, and he's also going to be attending this one, and he has a chapter on the math education. Um, we had healing through language, uh, and Miranda and her son had an exciting chapter of looking at intergenerational journey about preserving the Navajo language. So all the chapters in the book are around issues of advancing the culture, advancing the language. And I think, Miranda, you have a really interesting story about that kind of generational journey with you and your son and your forefathers. In my uh, doctoral research, I, I um, researched the life of my Chiche, my maternal grandfather, and the contribution he made as an interpreter uh, with the Navajo uh, Nation. And all of the work that he did, uh, which also helped developing and standardizing the orthography uh, in his work with Edward Tapier and contributing to the um, publication we see with Young and Morgan on the Navajo Dictionary. And reflecting on the tools that he used during his time to uh, accomplish his, his uh, life's work. And many of those tools that he used in his day helped preserve the Nebuzad, the Navajo language. And in that research, currently my son is also endeavoring in the same area as well and utilizing the technology of A to continue to preserve the Nebuzad, the Navajo language, and to use technology through software applications to develop a, uh, an app called Adone which teaches about the Navajo culture. And um, he's utilizing the technology in the 21st century to, to continue what um, his mother and his grandmother, grandfather did, great-grandfather did in the preservation of the Navajo language. This is an exciting story, that kind of intergenerational journey about preserving the language. And I guess your, your son, Albert, uses high technology in this as well, right, Miranda? <laughs> Yes, he does. He does. He developed the app that is now uh, available for, for people who want to learn about the Navajo plan. I just saw an article about that, and there was something on Instagram about him, and I thought we had him on the radio show. Didn't we have him on? We oh, had him yeah. on, like, last year, talking about the app. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. That's great to hear. Yeah, full circle. So, son and mom. That's awesome. Yes, yes. <laughs> But I did just see something about the app that he was doing. Um, I was on Instagram, and I saw it in a few different places. I, I don't know if the Navajo Times picked it up, but I did, I did see that. Congratulations yeah. to, to him yeah. and to you both. So I do want to go back and ask a couple things. So, sure. And this is kind of a little off topic, but it, since it's a, an, an education conference, do you think education has changed? How, how, how has it changed since before, during, and after COVID. You know, I talked to friends of mine that are educators, and they say that COVID has really changed education, um, that students are not as engaged, and that they've seen definite changes. What do you all think? Oh, let's see. I'll start, Miranda, and then let's see how we can engage in this. Um, okay. Of course, the, the COVID really hit the nation extremely hard. Uh, we have uh, people who are actually presenting at this conference that had, you know, 20 extended relatives that passed away during COVID. So it's been a, a real tragic event, uh, personally, uh, on the nation, and also around education. And a lot of the people uh, who were students, you know, got learning virtually, learning in their homes. The Internet was not doing very well, uh, and they get kind of isolated. So I think a lot of issues have come up around uh, mental health and isolation issues uh, with education. And 
my experience now is a lot of people are trying more and more to come back and engage and to figure out what that balance is between learning virtually and also engaging and learning with others uh, and building that kind of relationship and that rapport and that kind of co collegial learning that's so important to build the mind, body, and spirit. So uh, there are still a lot of people that like the virtual learning, but I think there are other people that are wanting more connection and building the totality of the education experience. What has your experience been, Miranda? Because you've been dealing with that at the Met College as well. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to be saying anything new here, but, but there certainly remains a challenge with the digital divide that we experience on Navajo and the issues with connectivity. Um, many of our uh, students and families uh, don't have regular access to the internet. And, um, you know, we could take, for example, the upcoming end to the affordable connectivity program which has extended internet to um, a lot of families, low-income families that made, that, that made it possible for them to maintain that internet connectivity. And that's what many uh, Navajo families rely on as well. So, so there's, there's the challenge of trying to access the online education uh, through internet. And then there was uh, the challenge of access to hardware, computers, printers, hotspots, for those where there was even greater challenges with connectivity because of where they were located in the valleys or, or the mesas or just a lack of connectivity altogether. And then having to go to the more, the, the larger towns, uh, let's say, for example, in, in Chinle, Arizona, and try to access the internet there uh, at the Burger King. Uh, which has Wi-Fi available for its customers. And during COVID, it was nice when uh, the Navajo Tribal Utility Authority provided that internet access for all of the students uh, and workers across Navajo to go to one of their local NTUA sites across the five agencies and access that, that free uh, Wi-Fi service that allowed that connectivity. Uh, they began to connect uh, some of the school buses uh, with internet access as well. So certainly connectivity is one of the challenges. Uh, the other was when you do have access, you can't run video along with, with audio. So to save the bandwidth and maintain that connectivity, you just have to keep your cameras off, you know, and, and, and just stay on audio to, to re remain connected to the internet. And then with respect to online education, it was challenging in the, in the sense that it was a new form of instruction in which students had to assume greater responsibility for their own learning. They were responsible for preparing, uh, reading all of those materials, producing uh, that student work, and oftentimes in isolation at home without, without that continual contact with their teachers. And it, it involved the enlisting the support of many families as well if they, if they were able to have that, that access to families who could, could help them with that homework. But with that, I've seen in my courses tremendous improvement in reading and writing uh, for many of my students uh, at Binet College. And the production of their work, you can see the, the improvement across time in their uh, writing skills. Uh, in addition, that just falls in uniquely with a concept on the Navajo Nation that we call which is self-directed learning. And online education helps Navajos attain that self-directed learning. And so that's been one of the beauties of, of online education along with the convenience of it. We know the great distances that our students have to travel to their school across the 26,000 square miles of Navajo. And, and certainly those opportunities in which they can learn from the uh, convenience of their own home and they don't have to travel those days, that's great. Or we see now for snow days, as an example, because that 
online delivery of education is now available, instead of students traversing in that inclement weather, they can work and go to school remotely from home. You know, so, so those have been some of the challenges. And I see a lot of our educators across Navajo, these educational administrators, really striving to meet that need to meet those demands and to put into the hands of their students that internet connectivity and the hardware um, and really retraining uh, teachers on how to deliver, devise, develop, and deliver that on the online curriculum that, that helps our Navajo students. Yeah, one of the uh, presenters at the conference coming up in June, like I mentioned, is Dr. Jason Arviso who works at Navajo Tech, and his whole presentation is on the use of broadband Internet for the nation, not only in education, but also in, in other ways, uh, K-12 through education, but what the enhanced uh, connectivity can do around the economy as well. So that's one of our yeah. key presenters uh, on June 7. Well, the conference sounds like it's going to be amazing. So let me backtrack. It is in June, correct? June 7. Yep, okay. June 7. And again, where is it going to be held? Uh, at the Navajo Nation Museum right there in Window Rock. In Window Rock. And you said registration is done on site, correct? That's correct. People show up at 8 o'clock and can just register for the conference there. And we'll start promptly at 8.30 and go through the entire day, ending about 4.30. Okay, and is there a website where anybody can find more information or contact you? It's actually co-sponsored not only by the nation, but the Department of Diné Education, the Office of Navajo Scholarship and Financial Assistance, and also the uh, Navajo Nation Teacher Education Consortium. So there's lots of uh, places that you can get information, and if people want some more information, it's just B Mink for Barbara Mink, B Mink at Fielding. F-I-E-L-D-I-N-G dot E-D-U. Um, the other person who has a lot of information on that is Ms. Rose Graham, who is the program director for the ONSPA office there in Window Rock. And that's the Office of Navajo Nation Scholarships and Financial Aid, correct? Yes, financial assistance, that's correct. Yep, okay. Um, and I really appreciate your time. And so thank you so much for coming on. I hope a lot of people check out the conference in June. It sounds like there's amazing things in your book, The Future of Navajo Education. Um, I actually am going to order that and check it out. So thank you. Thank you very much for having thank us. You, and, uh, I think it will, will be an exciting conference, and we look forward to a good attendance. Coming up on Native Talk Arizona, I'll talk with speaker and best-selling author DJ Vanis. Support for KRDP 90.7 FM comes in part from Native Health, with two locations in Phoenix, 4041 North Central Avenue, Building C, near the corner of Central Avenue and Indian School Road, and at 2423 West Dunlap Avenue. Native Health is also located in Mesa at 777 West Southern Avenue, near the corner of Southern Avenue and Extension Road. Native Health provides primary medical, dental, behavioral health, WIC, and wellness services for the urban Native American community. For more information, call 602-279-5262 or visit our webpage at nativehealthphoenix.com. Dot org.
Welcome back to Native Talk Arizona, presented by Native Health and KRDP 90.7 FM. I'm host Lanasha Pawati. DJ Vanis is a dynamic and internationally acclaimed motivational speaker who shows audience how to apply the warrior spirit at work and in life. He is the author of the best-selling books, The Tiny Warrior and The Warrior Within. Hello, DJ, and welcome to our show. Hi, Lanasha. Thank you for having me today. Absolutely. And before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your journey, and your background? Absolutely. I'd be happy to. I'm, I'm originally from Muskegon, Michigan. Um, I'm a proud uh, enrolled member of the Little River Band of Ottawa Indians. Um, I grew up as a military brat. My dad was in the military for 21 years in the Air Force. And so I grew up in North Dakota, South Dakota, uh, Mississippi. And then when I graduated high school, um, I was selected to, I got an appointment to the U.S. Air Force Academy. So I went there for college and then uh, graduated uh, with a BS in management. And then I actually stayed back for a year and helped uh, the academy recruit. Uh, So to go out into native communities, because we had such, uh, you know, small numbers of Native students who were going to the academy, and and any of the military academies are full-ride scholarships with benefits, and there's just not a lot of information out there in tribal communities, and so I wanted to change that, so I became part of uh, the recruiting team in what was called then the Minority Enrollment Office, which is now called the Office of Diversity, and I went out here, there, and everywhere, all across Indian country, and talked about the, the path to becoming an officer in the Air Force, and found that I absolutely enjoyed it, uh, absolutely loved it. And I started telling more and more stories, you know, not just on how to qualify, but also sharing milestones or or learning moments in my own life, like what it was like to go to combat survival school or what it was like to jump out of an airplane five times and those types of stories or or leave home for the first time. And, And all of a sudden it started kind of taking on a life of its own. And I stayed, I got into my regular career field, which was involved in space warfare. And then um, I was still speaking on the side and going to native education conferences and wherever I was called and and, uh, was kind of burning up my leave time and, uh, but was still loving, you know, loving being on that path. And then uh, I got my master's at University of Southern California and I went back and ran the, the office of minority enrollment. I was the chief of that office for four years and once I got on that path I was like you know this is what I feel like I was meant to do and I left the military in 2002 as a captain and started to do this full-time and so now I'm the author of three books I've been doing this for over 20 years full-time and I've worked with over 500 tribal nations um, and companies like P&G, Intel Corporation, Subaru, Costco, um, the US military and no two weeks for me are ever quite the same and i really enjoy that part of the work (laughs) but i love what i get to do for a living and who i get to work with um and i I work quite a bit in uh health care education basically anybody who's providing services to others uh that's kind of my my wheelhouse and that's that's the people i most enjoy working with and you've also were a speaker at our Native Health All Staff recently, which was phenomenal. Um, so, how did you get started in motivational speaking? Yeah, well, well, thank you very much for the feedback, and I had a blast with you all. I really did. Um, and like I said, you're you're my kind of folks. You know, whenever I'm in a place where the givers gather, that's where I feel I was meant to be because all my messaging is is I've always seen it as providing for the providers. Um, but how I got into the motivational aspect of it, like I said, was sharing more personal stories on moments of transformation, moments of facing fear of, of you know, uh, accomplishing a goal or stumbling and then learning a lesson, you know, sometimes painfully. And I started sharing that more and more in my regular, you know, kind of briefings for how to get into the Air Force Academy or how to get it, you know, become an officer in the Air Force. And the more I started doing that, the more two things happened. Number one, I started enjoying it more. And number two, I saw how much more the audience was receptive, you know, not just the youth, but also the parents, uh, the grandparents that were in the crowd. And I, and I started, or the teachers, you know, when I would do this, these programs at schools, and I started to see that this kind of took on a life of its own. 
And over the years, you know, it's kind of like a seed breaks a shoot, and you don't know what it's going to develop, and all of a sudden you look, you know, and you see this, you know, beautiful, you know, full-size tree, and you're like, oh, it was always in that seed. You just didn't know how it would emerge. And so that's why, you know, I've looked at this as kind of an ongoing journey of discovery. I'm still growing. I'm still learning. I'm still, you know, absolutely in love with what I get to do for a living. Um, but there's so much more that I want to do and, you know, so many more directions. But I, I'm enjoying the journey. And uh, like I said, it's just it, it's all about being out there to create a positive impact with the groups I work with. And what is your message The primary message I share is I show people and organizations how to use our traditional warrior principles from our native communities in action uh, to get better results in what we do in life and leadership and especially service to others. Um, There are so many beautiful, timeless principles uh, in our tribal cultures collectively uh, that not only have impact or, or, or are relevant today, but still have impact in the world that we live in. And whether you're native or not is irrelevant. I mean, these are just beautiful principles of resiliency, teamwork, ongoing personal development, serving others at our best regardless of circumstances, um, staying balanced, taking care of ourselves, mind, body, and spirit in the work that we do. You know, there are so many components to that message, and I always get really passionate to share, you know, not only those principles, but, you know, angles or, or philosophies from our culture, you know, to see the world through a different lens. And that's one of the things that most excites me about the work that I get to do. And how do you integrate your indigenous background into your messages? Well, again, I take those components, you know, that are timeless, that are traditional, uh, things that, you know, we as Native people have always relied on, not just survival, but for thriving, you know, in, in the past and also today. Uh, The things that make us who we are, you know, that grit, the resiliency, Um, focusing on positive outcomes, on community. You know, there there are so many different angles to it, but I just have always been excited to to share that piece because I've always been proud of who I am and where I came from. Uh, My grandmother taught our traditional language uh, when I was a kid, when I I was uh, back in Michigan. Uh, I've got a lot of surrogate grandpas and grandmas across Indian country with all the different tribal communities I've worked in throughout the years. And I'm constantly weaving those ideas and philosophies into the work that I do. Because like I said, the ideas are so beautiful, they're so powerful, and in my you know, assessment, they're more needed now in the world today than they ever have been. And so that's what I get excited about, you know, sharing those pieces and components. And like I said, I'm constantly learning you know, as I go. I know school is never going to be out for me, and I try to keep that curiosity alive in, in all the work that I do. And has there been any challenges? Wow, where do you want to start with that one? That's a, <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> there have been many, and they continue. And, you know, we should never curse challenges. They bring, you know, the challenges that we go through in life, you know, they bring out the best stuff we never knew we had. And I've had so many, you know, even getting out of the military and starting this full time, struggling, you know, at the beginning to, to make ends meet. Um, going through the challenges of, you know, the, when the economy tanked in 2008, uh, when everything happened after, you know, uh, 9-11, because my, I had not even gone into, left the military yet when that happened. And so I got put under what's called stop loss, and I was geared up to go out and do this full time in October of 2001. And then, of course, September 2001 happened, and we were put under stop loss until the next summer. So, um and, and there, the challenges continue, you know, going through the pandemic, you know, and having to pivot, re-pivot, basically reinvent my business uh, and being able to del- deliver in a completely different way. Um, you know, I'm known as a, a keynote speaker, you know, being in, in front of the group and I look at what I do is, you know, uh, part education, part empowerment and part entertainment and that energy is very different online in a virtual setting. And I had never done a virtual program before. Uh, so that was a steep learning curve, and now I'm very comfortable with it. But it, it, you know, it took a, a while to get there. But there, you know, the challenges are always going to be there. You know, every book that I wrote was a challenge, was a, you know, self-discovery. 
Um, you know, just there, there's been so many, but like I said, I, I, I've looked at those challenges now after learning what I've learned is, you know, when I, I welcome them because I know that's the part that's going to, you know, those, those are the parts of life that grow us and they're not always fun. They're not always comfortable. And, and actually, usually they're not, but like I said, those are the things that bring out the best stuff in us. And I'm, I'm a, you know, walking testament to that. You know, I wrote my latest book, The Warrior Within, which was the biggest project I've been part of, you know, it was published by Penguin Random House, one of the big, you know, publishers. And I got that book deal um, during the height of the pandemic. And so that was, you know, one of those moments of, you know, a lot of confusion, a lot of wondering what to do, and then tr trying to figure out a new pathway forward. And, you know, I wasn't on the road traveling, so I said, well, now I have an opportunity to do something else and was able to create that during that time. So, uh, yeah, the challenges are ongoing, but, I, you know, life wouldn't be the same without them, and uh, I welcome them when they show up. That is very true, and it's amazing how you've over overcame all those um, challenges. So what do you think are the biggest challenges you think people are facing, like, today? Oh, my gosh, there are so many, and that's a great question because we all wrestle with this. We all struggle with this. You know, I, I think that there's, you know, there are so many different, uh, that you, well, the pace of the world, how fast things are moving. Um, the speed of life is the speed of light. You know, it's hard to keep up anymore, uh, let alone actually take the time to grow ourselves in any significant way or develop ourselves. And that's the big challenge is realizing that more is not always more, you know, uh, the older I get and the longer my journey goes, I, I find that less is more. I find value in solitude and quiet, um, having time to reflect and, you know, actually think about what I'm thinking about. And a lot of times in, in the world that we live in, the, the pace of life is so fast, people don't even look up to see where they're, where they're going. You know, I, I think uh, the bombardment of social media, which a lot of times you know, I think is a social ill uh, because it's putting people into these moments of isolation, comparison, things that are not productive or positive in, in the human development, especially for our youth. You know, I think it can be very, very damaging. You know, the, the studies are starting to show that more and more. And we didn't even know, we didn't even need the studies to show us that. It was already coming out in, in stories and the way that people talk about it um, because we, we are inundated with messages uh, that make us doubt ourselves. And so I think that's one of the big challenges of the world today is trying to use the right tools for the right moment and not trying to farm out, you know, one of the most sacred endeavors we have as human beings, like our human to human connection and farming that out, you know, through just an app or digital means, you know, we still create relationships with people, you know, um, not technology. And I, I'm not bashing technology. I use it all the time. But I think technology can enhance a relationship. But I think it's very dangerous when technology substitutes for a relationship. Phenomenal. We all need community, <laughs> yes. right? That's traditional. <laughs> <laughs> and DJ, what kind of message do you try to get across to people you speak to? Oh, I love that question. Um, and, and it's always, you know, there's always common themes, and it's, and it's always changing a little bit each year. I, you know, I look at my messaging as kind of like a bonsai tree. You know, I, I'm growing areas, I'm clipping areas, but really at the end of the day, it's, it's sharing a message to people that we can, be, we can become better versions of ourselves, and it's our responsibility to create that. You know, we can't sit back and wait for that to show up. We can't wait for somebody to do it for us. Every day that we get up, <clears throat> you know, we have a chance to engage in our journey, but also to improve, uh, to, to improve the way that we do things, to improve the way that we take care of ourselves, the way that we take care of each other, and improve the quality of the information that we put into our mind, uh, the quality of the activities that we participate in, you know, where we put our time and energy, and, and being on a constant journey of improving, you know, just little by little each day, not dramatic sweeping changes, you know, it's, that's what I always love about like New Year's Eve resolutions, you know, it's, it, you know, people have these huge ideas and they try to recreate everything in the span of a week, you know, and, and I think what life comes back to is doing, not doing everything at once, it's doing a little bit of something every day. Uh, that's really what creates not only momentum, but 
really what creates results. Um, I think that we were put here to serve. You know, I share that in all my programs. Um, I think we uh, need to take much better care of ourselves in the world. You know, and I work with a lot of service providers, and I always am adamant about that message. I tell them you cannot be a warrior when you're falling apart. And that warrior role was all about service to others, it was about fighting for something bigger than our own personal welfare, leading by example, and being a contributor to your tribe. And you cannot do that if you're falling apart. So I'm, I'm very adamant. I'm a passionate, diehard advocate for self-care uh, because I know that when we, do, when we take care of ourselves very, you know, in a good way, we're able to deliver great results for other people. And what is your advice on how to approach understanding others from different backgrounds? Have the conversation. Never assume anything. You know, if you actually respect and want to create relationship with other people, you've got to be able to ask questions and be willing to sit back and listen. You know, not filling in the blanks for anybody, anyone about anything. You know, it's have the conversation and ask. And when we're able to do that, you know, we're, we learn so much more about that person and and really ultimately you're showing that person deep respect because you're actually showing that you care enough to ask the question in the first place so we don't all have to be alike to get along we just have to learn to respect the differences and that's another thing that you know diversity even in nature this isn't a you know federal or state law or a, or a corporate policy nature teaches us the value of diversity you know when we have many different things and one biosphere, um, we have a stronger environment overall. And it's the same in society, in our communities, is different points of view, different perspectives. These don't have to be threatening things. They can be some of the best things that we have to work with. But, you know, we live in a very divided age, you know, and I don't think leadership is about who can yell the loudest or who can bludgeon the other person with <laughs> their ideas. I think, you know, traditional leadership in our tribal communities was always about consensus. It was about having conversations to understand other people's points of view and not, ha not shouting down what feels uncomfortable or what you don't agree with. And so I, I think it's, it's, you know, taking the time to be respectful, to be empathetic, to understand that, you know, not everybody has to think or be like us. And thankfully, that's, that's still true. Uh, that's what makes the world special and interesting. But we get into these divided spaces where we're not even willing to ask the question. How do you think? You know, why do you think that way? You know, those basic kind of questions create dialogue. And when you do that, you can create answers together as a group. DJ, I know you shared with us your uh, book that you've written, The Warrior Within. Can you tell us mm -hmm. more about the discovering your warrior spirit? Yes, absolutely. That warrior spirit is all about that, that internal core. And we all have it. You know, it's that, that energy that is willing to push out and fight for something bigger than self. Uh, that's, that's unwilling to quit. That finds a way forward. Uh, it's deeper than motivation because it's connected to our very purpose, our essence of being. And it's here to create an impact and to serve someone else in a good way. That warrior spirit sustains us through hard times, through doubt, through stumbles, through mistakes. When I wrote The Warrior Within, it was actually, like I said, it was during the height of the pandemic. I had been talking to a lot of the groups I worked with that were involved in healthcare, education, that were involved in social services, government or military positions. And, you know, these are people who have dedicated their lives to serving others. And they were all struggling. Every group I talked to was struggling because they were not only trying to continue to serve well, but also take care of their family and themselves. And a lot of them were just running, you know, on empty. And so when I wrote the book, you know, it was with that idea of how can we really tap into that inner part of ourselves, that warrior within. And that's why the book, you know, was written for those folks uh, to help, you know, create a sense of resiliency, a renewed sense of strength, creating the right environment for success, uh, learning how to leverage our resources, um, including our own personal resources, not just our team members or information out in the world. Um, you know, trying to cover all these different components about facing, facing fear with courage, uh, partnering up with the right folks. Um, you know, there are so many different ideas in that book 
but they're all dedicated towards making somebody a stronger, more effective version of themselves. And so that's where the book came from. And that was my latest, uh, my first two books. The first one was The Tiny Warrior, um, A Path to Personal Discovery and Achievement, which is a bestseller. Uh, The second book is a novel called Spirit on the Run. And then The Warrior Within was my latest book. Um, And that's available both print and audio. And if you're too busy to read, I'll read the whole thing for you. I spent four days in the sound booth uh, (laughs) doing the audible version uh, for those folks who are too busy to read. So um, I hope people are, you know, willing to check that out. And uh, I poured my heart into the book, and I hope it has an impact in, in people's lives that pick it up. And DJ, where can they purchase your book or also access your your Audible? Yeah, anywhere books are sold. So on you know Amazon, Barnes and Noble, you can go directly to the Penguin Random House site and look up the Warrior Within, and it'll show all the different ways that you can access the book. Uh, Target, Barnes and Noble, uh, Google Books, uh, they're all the platforms are there, uh, both in print and audio. DJ, can you tell us what one of your favorite presentation memory is? Oh my gosh, Lanasha, that's such a great question. I have so many. <laughs> um, there, there's so many. That, uh, I'm trying to think of you know one of the ones that I was most nervous about was speaking at the White House, uh, which that was an incredible honor to do. That was many years ago, um, and you know the blue curtains, the the White House seal. Uh, that was a, a very special memory, especially thinking about the fact that I came from you know, parents, teenage parents who were in poverty. Uh, I slept in a dresser drawer for the first three months of my life. And to come from that kind of background and show up speaking at the White House, I mean, it just was a goosebump moment of coming full circle and realizing it doesn't matter where we come from. It doesn't matter what we have. What matters is how we honor where we come from and how we use what we have every day. And, and that was just one of those moments I'll never forget. Uh, a very special moment was going back and speaking to my old school district in Mississippi, and that was last summer. And uh, met my, got to meet up with my high school or my elementary school principal, um, and meet a lot of my former teachers and former classmates, and spoke to their you know annual school year kickoff, and got to return back to where I went to high school, and got a certificate from the mayor. Uh, that declared uh, July 23rd uh, DJ Vanis Day. <laughs> so that was that was pretty special too, because I, there are so many of those people that were in that crowd that defined my life, that encouraged me uh, during you know my elementary school, middle school, and high school years. I was so grateful that they were there and present, and that was a really special uh, memory. But I, I have so many. I, I've worked with so many different awesome groups, including, including Native Health, and have so many people along the way that I've just so enjoyed learning from, spending time with, and reconnecting year after year. I've, you know, I've got a lot of groups that I've worked with for a long time now, you know, over two decades, and I always love returning. It's like going home again, and that's a really special thing, and, and I uh, not only value it, I, I treasure it. Yeah, I bet a lot of the work that you are doing is very rewarding. And I can't imagine how amazing that makes you feel and all the changes you're making in everyone's lives as well. Um, DJ, and finally, can you tell our listeners where they can go to find more information about your presentations, about your book, and how or who can they contact for further questions? Yes, absolutely, and thank you for asking. Uh, the be- best way to get a hold of me is just through our website, which is nativediscovery.com, um, and that's got information on what I do, who I work with, my background, there's videos, there's information on my books. It's kind of a good one-stop shop, just nativediscovery.com. And then I'm also on LinkedIn, um, just under DJ Vanis and under uh, Facebook, uh, which is at Building Warriors, and I'm on Instagram and uh, also on X. So you can find me online. I've got my own YouTube ch- channel as well, at Building Warriors, and um, hope to uh, have a visit from you soon. 
Perfect. Well, I'd like to thank you, DJ, for coming on air with us today to tell us about your book and also giving us some amazing advice and sharing all of this great information that you're doing in the in the community. Thank you, Lanasha. It's been a joy to be here with you, and uh, I wish you the best on your journey forward. Thank you for listening to Native Talk Arizona, supported by Native Health and KRDP 90.7 FM. Audio editing by Javier Quiroga, and the executive producer is Susan Levy. And I'm host Lanasha Puati. We hope you tune in again next week. If you have any questions, please email us at nativetalkaz at radiophoenix.org.